welcome to Figure Out Your Life Podcast, a podcast where we try to find the answers to life's everyday questions. I am your host, Toya T, a.k.a. Toya T, Ph.D., a.k.a. Yo, sister, for my mother, mister, a.k.a. the queen of giggles, <laughs> a.k.a. I am not the average girl from your video. My worth is not determined by the price of my clothes. No matter what I wear, I will always be your girl, Toya T. <laughs> I promise y'all I'm going to keep my day job because I'm not a singer. India Ari, I am not. Anyway, let me stop playing. Welcome back, everybody. It's another week, another day, another hour surviving in the pandemic. As most of you guys know, I have a new job and my official start date uh, was July 1st, but my real start date, like actually doing something that they are paying me for is August 3rd. So before that, I had to finish all of my onboarding. So signing up for my benefits and my retirement and all that other stuff, right? Here's the thing. I almost missed out on my benefits. <laughs> and that's really funny because uh, for the last several years, my whole goal has been to get a J-O-B-B. For those who are new, a J-O-B-B is a job with benefits. That's how I describe it. I just don't want a job. I need a job. I need a J-O-B-B, a job with benefits. And I finally get me a job with benefits, right? And I signed up for my benefits, or I thought I did. And then the HR person hit me up and was like, so I realized that you haven't signed up for your benefits. And if you want to waive them, you still have to sign in and fill out that form. And I was like, "What? wait a second. Excuse me? Ex- ex- excuse me more? <laughs> I was completely confused because I had signed up for my benefits the first day I was able to, July 1st, when they sent out that that email saying like, you are now able to go sign up for your benefits. I did that. I spent one night just going through the entire thing, signing up for everything. And I thought I was all good and dandy. I was like, okay, I did. I did that. I don't have to worry. Turns out that I didn't press submit. I went into the HR website and everything I had checked was still there. So it saved, but my behind did not press submit so I almost ended up with no benefits my mama would have been so mad at me I would have been pissed but a shout out to the HR officer for reaching out to me after she saw that I had not uh, signed up for my benefits you are the real winner okay also uh, yesterday my job had a town hall meeting to explain how the school year was going to run and They told us that we will be teaching remotely. The tentative plan is that we will be working from home for the first few months. So first time that I meet my new students at my new school will be from my computer and the safety of my home. And depending on how America does with this pandemic, eventually I'll end up in the classroom first part time and then eventually full time. But the way that America is set up right is that people don't care about other people and people are really selfish. I mean, the governor of Missouri pretty much said the kids need to go back to school 100% full time Monday through Friday. And if they get sick and they will get sick, they won't go to the hospital and clog things up. They'll just go home. And all I thought was like, you selfish mofo. Okay. So they get sick and they go home, but how many people did they infect while they were sick at school and when they go home, who are they staying with that they're not going to infect? How do you like, come on, that's not a plan. That's not something that has public safety in mind. And as a governor, as the head of your state, that is just really ridiculous. Like that is obviously putting money over the lives of human beings and particularly children. It's so funny when these conservatives or these Republicans or whatever want to talk about, oh, I'm pro-life, I'm pro-life, I'm pro-life. No, let's not abort babies. Let's not do this. But then when it's about actually protecting those who are alive, when it's about protecting children, they don't care. (laughs) They don't care. For some reason, they care more about fetuses and embryos than they do about actual living children. They care about the dollars. They want their parents to go back to work 
full time and for the parents to go back to work, they need the kids to be somewhere full time. And where do they put them in schools so they can affect the teachers and the staff and everybody that comes in contact with them? How's that going to work out when the, the sick kid gets their teacher sick and the teacher can't teach that class? Who's going to be watching them kids? Huh? 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 Let me know. My state has been pretty good on shutdown measures and flattening our curve, but we can't trust these other mofos that may be coming into the state and spreading the virus. Like, look at Florida. That's all I got to say. Look at Florida. But then again, Florida did not really shut down like we did. They shut down for two seconds and reopened right back up like it was a holiday weekend. <sighs> anyway, the silver lining about all this is that I don't have to worry about adjusting to a new commute, so I'm very happy about that. The other silver lining is that it has resolved another issue for me, which is this growing anxiety that I have over figuring out how to show up as my authentic self in my new work environment and not lose my (laughs) J-O-B-B. I spent over 12 years in higher education where there's so much more freedom. You don't have to show up every single day. You don't have to be at the school all day long. You don't have to have constant contact with students or even with other people that you work with. Sometimes you can avoid your department head, your provost, your dean. All these people will probably never see you. You can come in and out and no one except for the students have eyes on you. And there has been times when I've come in and out without any eyes on me just to do some work. And it's like none of y'all can see me. I'm going to my office, close the door. Only reason that you know I'm here is because you can hear my music. Okay. But there's a lot more freedom in terms of how people are able to show up. I've had professors show up <laughs> teaching class with their dog on their lap. I took a class in at NYU when I was in graduate school. And this one professor, I can't remember her name. It was an evening class. She showed up every single class with her dog. The dog's name was White Boy. Hilarious. Because when we would take breaks, she'd put the dog down and the dog would run around the department And she'd be like, white boy, white boy, come here, white boy. And it was hilarious. I've also had some professors show up looking like the modern, fashionable, working woman, like Samantha from Sex and the City or Joan from Girlfriends or Miranda Priestly from The Devil Wears Prodders. I mean, just fabulous. Could be on the cover of Ebony or Vogue. Just all kinds of levels of fabulousness. And when I started teaching... At first, I wanted to show up (laughs) as professionally looking as possible. So I would dress like business casual. I wrote out all of my lecture notes. Like I had notes upon notes upon notes. I showed up to teach, even though the only people that I would see are the students who are all dressed down and are there to hear me speak, to teach, to inform and not to see how I show up. But I would wear my dress pants, a blouse or sweater. I showed up every single class in my business casual. And I didn't even have that much business casual (laughs) clothes. And it was just very nerve wracking. As I got more relaxed, I started showing up a lot more relaxed wearing jeans and T-shirts because I realized I needed to be comfortable. And sometimes I had other things to do after. And I was still a young 20 something living in New York City. Uh, I started teaching. I was still in graduate school. So just FYI on that. And I was like, why am I wearing all these clothes when I got to take two trains to get home from here, okay? I got to be on the subway for some time. And then maybe I had class earlier, like my own class as a graduate student. And then I'm going from my class to teaching class. Plus, that adjunct life, they don't pay, they weren't paying me enough to be dressed like this was my full-time job because it wasn't. (laughs) It was a part-time employee. But as I got more relaxed and comfortable, I started dressing more comfortable And mainly for the fact that I realized that I was dressing based on trying to impress the department because I wanted to be seen as professional or qualified professor. I was doing a lot of things to present myself as something, even though it was making me uncomfortable. And a lot of my decisions were tied to issues about age, race, appearance and status. The fact that in my first teaching position, I was either just a little bit older than my students or younger than my students. There was one woman in my class that actually had a daughter my age and said that she had started college because she had raised her kids, put them through school, and now she was trying to get her education on. So it was just a lot of issues of appearance. I want to be looked at as the professor, not one of the students, but it's hard to do that when you're close in age or younger than your students. And so dress 
became a way for me to present that. Issues about race, it didn't really pop up in my first teaching experience because the the majority of the class was black and Hispanic. And then when I started working more wider spaces, my race became uh, a part of my decisions on how I presented myself. And also the status, like my professional status. I was in my third year of graduate school when I started teaching. I didn't have a PhD. I didn't have a master's. I felt people who taught had these certifications, had these certain statuses. And it just seemed weird to me that I was in graduate school and I was teaching a class as an adjunct. There were so many things that came into play when I decided how I showed up. And by the end of my college teaching career, as of now, because I am not saying that I wouldn't go back, but I was dressing however I wanted. At that point, I was super comfortable, super. As long as my goodies were covered and I didn't wear anything with racial slurs or racist iconography, I either dressed to impress me, (laughs) myself, and I. One day I'll be wearing dress pants, a nice blouse, a nice work-appropriate dress. And the next day I was wearing all sweats, a shell toe Adidas, and head wraps to class. It just depended on my mood, depended on the weather, depended on what I had to do that day. And it all came from the fact that I was a lot more relaxed in the way I presented myself. And I was a lot more comfortable in where I worked. I was, I had already worked there for about six years and it was a gradual process. I kind of had a breaking point where I realized showing up as myself, being comfortable, um, not worrying about perfectionism was holding me back that I was spending so much time trying to appear as the professor appear like I was qualified, appear professional, that I was making myself unhappy, one. I was like really depressed. One of the contributing factors was the stress I was putting on myself to appear like I knew everything, that I didn't make any mistakes. I would beat myself up if I wrote a word wrong or or pronounced a word wrong in front of my students, who at that time were predominantly white. And I'd be very picky about my clothes and all that stuff. And I just spent so much energy trying to present myself as this professor in my mind, which was very much based off of the stereotypical white old college professor that we've seen in the media. Maybe some of us have had in person. And I had had come to a point, it was right around the time after Trayvon Martin was killed and the Black Lives Matter movement had just started that I just was like, fuck it, I am showing up. I'm qualified, I know what I'm talking about. They hired me, I have way more education than these students, I don't know why I'm worried about being seen as qualified. Like these kids are trying to get their bachelor's degree and I already got a bachelor's degree and a master's at this point. I was about to get my PhD. I was just like, I can't deal with you guys. I'm going to show up the way I show up. I'm going to give you the information the best way that I can. I'm not going to put on airs. I traded perfectionism for transparency and authenticity. And once I started doing that, when I started showing up as my authentic self, what freed me to execute the job that I had in front of me, which was to teach these kids in a way that they can understand, speak to them in a way they can understand, give them examples in a way that they can understand and allowing my brain to move as fast as it always does without filtering. I had found that way to show up as my authentic self and to do my job at my best ability, but it took time. And now that I am entering into a new workspace, I started to fear having to start this process again. I was feeling like new workplace, who dis? You know, who am I going to show up as? I don't want to go through that process again. It's mentally draining. And this leads me to this week's podcast episode, which is trying to figure out how to be your authentic self every day at work, at home. How do I show up on day one, day numero uno as myself? How can we show up as ourselves? I want to start this off with something I saw on Instagram. The post read... Dear black girl, specifically, so I beg you, do not shrink yourself. Do not give in to imposter syndrome and do not play small. You are in the room because you're supposed to be there and because you're the brightest star in it. I picked this quote because I felt that there are many characteristics that determine how comfortable you are showing up as yourself. I feel the social hierarchy of the society that we live in. So for America... The fact that white straight men are at the top of the socioeconomic hierarchy, the power hierarchy, they're allowed to show up 
exactly how they are because no one can check them because they're already at the top. They're not worried about losing their jobs. They're not worried about losing, not worried about losing their status because they're at a place where the people judging them look just like them or just like them. So that's how you have someone like Trump coming out talking about he grabbing women by the pussy and Mexicans are rapists and and murderers and that he's not racist but yet he does things that are very racist that he can do all these things that are problematic he can come out during a pandemic and talk absolute nonsense and still be in power he still be able to have his job even though we impeached him the mofo is still there and you know why because he's allowed to do that and for those who are not in that category are not at the top of the hierarchy you start seeing how people don't show up as themselves based off of these things. And the reason I like the quote is that when you think about the hierarchy where it goes white men and then you have white women, then you have black men, then you have black women (laughs) and, and other groups in between. I'm just skipping going through the spectrum. And so usually black women are at the very bottom. Black people are on the bottom socioeconomically when you're talking hierarchies based off of racial classification Blackness was created to be the bottom and whiteness was created to be at the top. I mean, they created whiteness uh, in the 1700s. I keep forgetting the dates. Elite white landowners created it to stop poor whites who uh, were disenfranchised. Some of them were former indentured servants to stop them from forming alliances with enslaved Africans and Native Americans who were also at the bottom. Right. And to increase their numbers, they were like, hey, okay, so what's the difference between you guys and these folks that we're trying to keep down? Let's give you whiteness. So whiteness means that you can't be a slave. Whiteness means that you are untaught. Whiteness means that you get to be your authentic self. And blackness means the opposite of that. Blackness means that you can be enslaved. Blackness means that you cannot show up as yourself, that you always have to change things about yourself to be, to be able to live. (laughs) not even to be respected or to move up in the world, to be able to live. And even now we realize that no matter how you try to follow the rules, you can still die. (laughs) They'll still take you out. You can still be fired. You can still not move up in the world. That's how you end up having black men having a lower employment rate than high school graduate white men. Like, think about that. You tell them, hey, get your education, fly straight. And then you find out that they can't get jobs at the same rate as those who didn't go to college who just have a high school degree that you told us is no longer the minimum, but is actually below the minimum to get a job that will pay you somewhat of a living wage. So I love that it points out to black women because, again, we're at the bottom. We have you have gender against us and race. And then when you add in other factors like sexuality, education status, immigrant status, citizenship status, class status, all this other stuff, you'll see the hierarchy. But still, we're at the bottom. We're usually the ones that are most policed in our presentations of self. So I love that it starts off by saying that. And I, I took it because it's I felt like it was talking to me because I'm, I'm a black girl. I'm a black girl. I'm a, I'm a proud black girl. And I've experienced that. I've shrunk in myself in white spaces growing up in Boston and going to predominantly white schools and working in businesses that are predominantly white. I have shrunk in myself so that I don't scare people. I have experienced imposter syndrome like, oh, my gosh, what am I doing in here? Everyone else is so much smarter than me. I have played small. I have been the quiet one in the corner. Oh, the you don't talk that much. It's because I don't want to come off as the threat. It's always been a fight to figure out how to be my authentic self. Usually it takes a long time for me to warm up. Part of it is because I'm a cancer. I'm a crab. I stay in that shell until I know it's safe. And that is a part of being authentic. Being your true authentic self means what you say in life aligns with your actions. As I always like to say, walk it like you're talking. Actions speak louder than words. Put your money where your mouth is. Like, you got to show up as yourself. Don't say, I'm just a little church mouse. And then you twerk it up in the club every night. Don't tell me, show up the way you are. I'm not saying that people don't have various aspects of themselves, but I feel a lot of times we close ourselves off. Being your authentic self goes beyond what you do for a living, what possessions you own, who you are to someone else. Are you someone's mom, their, their sister, their girlfriend, their aunt? their brother, their husband, like it goes past that. Being authentic means that you act in ways that show your true self and how you feel. Rather than showing people only a particular side of yourself, you express your whole self genuinely. 
That means to succeed in being authentic, you first have to know who your true self actually is. And this requires self-awareness, mindfulness, and self-acceptance. So the whole story that I told you before about my experiences in higher education, particularly as a professor, is that it took a long time for me to figure out who I am to be comfortable with that. Once I reached that point, I felt like my life flourished personally and even in my job professionally, I got way better feedback. Them kids loved it. I mean, pretty much after I had that breakthrough, I pretty much talked to everybody the same. My parents, my grandparents, my students. There are certain things that I won't say fully in front of my parents, but I curse in front of my parents. I've learned that there is certain levels of what I can do, but I'm I'm always trying to show up as myself. If I check people in my classroom about certain things that they say, I check people in my real life. So that's what I mean about being authentic. You have to be aware of who you are and be confident in it. Where do we learn to hide our authenticity? We learn to hide parts of ourselves for many different reasons and from different places, mainly from the five agents of socialization. I'm going right into my sociology background, folks. Bear with me, but I'll make it very clear and very quick. So there are five agents of of socialization, your family, your friends, schoolwork, and the media. These are all places and people that help you figure out how you're supposed to act in society. So the first agent of socialization is your family because they're the first people that you have contact with. They're the ones that teach you how to speak, how to talk, how to dress, how do you address other people, what behaviors are appropriate in the house, not in the house. They're the ones teaching you all these things. So the whole hiding our authenticity starts first at home. <laughs> and then we, you know, go off to school and we also make friends and then we learn what's appropriate in school and what's not appropriate in school you learn from your friends how you're supposed to show up to be cool to be liked how you're not supposed to show what you're not supposed to do and then when you go to work you get a whole nother set of rules and then the media will have images or sometimes no images of you or people who look like you and then we'll put out ideas about what to expect from people who look like you for example as a black woman there's all these these archetypes of black women where we're angry, we're sassy, where your mammy, you know, hey, hey, baby, hey, come, come over here and let me, let me, let me whip you up some food. Like we have seen very few images of introverted black women because people always expect black women to be the sassy friend. Hey girl. mm -hmm, Yep. I see you. And I've had occurrences in my own classrooms where I don't know if I'm in my comfortableness, I have done something that's sassy, you know, snap my fingers, move my head. But I've had some students, white male students, give me the snap and the head tilt. And I'm like, should I address this? Because I don't know if he just going off of a stereotype as what black women do or if I just did it without even thinking. There's a lot of things that media puts out that we also have to contend with or try to to fulfill. That's why I mentioned the whole introverted black women thing because I read that black women aren't allowed to be introverts in public because people associate them with the loud, the sassy, the assertive kind of image and when you're not that people are like well why don't you speak more what's wrong with you and some of these women from the article actually start presenting in this extroverted sassy black woman way just to appease their co-workers and other people around them that have these expectations of them that aren't part of their authentic self but they're just trying to preserve themselves so that they don't become even more of a target based off of them not acting the way people expect. And for many black people in general, altering our appearance and mannerisms to fit white expectations is a matter of instinct. Like we've been doing this for centuries because it has been a way that we have survived. Those who owned enslaved Africans and enslaved people, they set out what the guidelines of life for those that they enslaved and it was to control them you cannot learn to read you can't write as a way to separate to make different to control and people followed that to stay alive and those who went outside of these uh, expectations would be punished or they had to leave they had to flee and even after uh, the end of slavery in the United States 
there were still these restrictions on black life because those in power had these expectations and said, you are supposed to be this. That's how we end up turning into the funny one, the sassy one, or we come off as a threat or we come off as somebody's mammy or their auntie, which are all tropes that have been created in our lives and have been reinforced in these different aspects of our lives. As I had pointed out with the family, the friends, the school, work and media, all these things, you get all these reinforcements of what you're expected to do, especially when a lot of power being held by white men in the schools, workplaces and in the media. Sometimes you just get all these contradictory ideas about how you're supposed to present yourself, how you're supposed to show up. Altering one's appearance to meet arbitrary white standards of respectability and professionalism is generational. It's a survival mechanism that has been passed down. This is the legacy of slavery where you will have these ideas of what you don't do in front of white folks, what you don't talk about in quote unquote mixed company. It has become generational passing from one generation to the next at this point we need to just throw out the expectations of what it is to be respectable or professional because it seems like it has not worked so why not just be yourself the passing down of things like flattening your hair for black women for special events and occasions when you're a young girl like ooh, I get to hair- straighten my hair for my 10th birthday or for my first communion or for my auntie's wedding and you put this specialness on straightened hair even though black women um, have different types of hair some have straight some have curly but the majority of us have this like variation of textures and to put one kind of style as the special kind as the professional kind passes down this idea of what Uh, is expected of you and it may not be your authentic self you might like your hair the way it is but it's like oh we'll we'll make something special about it then you take that learn it and then apply it to other parts of your life so it's like oh when I go up for my first job interview I gotta flatten my hair I gotta straighten my hair because that is special that is something that's seen as better than what my hair looks like on a regular basis And it's interesting when we start talking about appropriation of black culture and good examples of that being like the Kardashians, the Kardashian Jenners and all all of these non-black women that are going out and getting these features, they cherry pick from black women's anatomies like our, our butts, our lips, our hairstyles, our attitudes, appropriating it, embellishing it and then renaming it as an innovative white beauty trend. And you can't wear our cornrows in school, but then Kim Kardashian wears cornrows and calls it uh, boxer braids or calls it Bo Derek braids. Both of them are not the correct names for them because they didn't originate from these people. And the people they originated from are chastised or penalized for actually wearing them. But when she wears it, it's trendy. It's cool. It's hot. It's edgy. Right. And they do that without even addressing issues of representation. If you wanted to have people with cornrows on the cover of your magazine and call it fresh and new, why aren't you actually picking the people that naturally do this? Not just because it's a hot trend, but because they've grown up doing this. This is how they actually care for their hair, how they style their hair. But no, instead of getting more black models, we're going to get Kim Kardashian and, and Kylie Jenner wearing braids and call it the new hot trend. And not penalize them, but actually reward them for this with praise and money. Unfortunately for black people and people of color, we spend so much time falling into the pressures of accommodating white fragility. And it it causes a lot of stress because you constantly feel like you're being scrutinized. It's the stress of over scrutiny that alerts you to certain subtle shifts in tone and gesture that could invalidate your personhood. For those who are navigating the workplaces while black, it is a constant topic of conversation about how to show up as yourself, how to be authentic, but then still be seen as professional. Although ideas about professionalism are very much tied to arbitrary white standards that constantly change. This topic is is a constant heated topic of conversation between me and my mother. My mother works in corporate America, so she has to wear professional clothes to work. But for me, I don't have to. And it doesn't affect my work and it doesn't affect my work performance. And it's not like I'm showing up to a presentation or job interview dressed in sweats. But if I have to show up to class to teach 
something for uh, an hour and 50 minutes and I know I'm going to be running around the classroom and it's cold as hell outside and my body aches or whatever, I'm going to show up the way I can. Other people get to wear T-shirts at my job. I see people wearing T-shirts all the time. Okay, I'm going to come in teach my class of the day and leave and go home. So the only people that have seen me are the 30 students that are in my classroom. Right. And why am I trying to impress them? I had already stopped trying to impress them. I showed up, I'm dressed, but I've come prepared with the stuff that I'm going to teach you because that's what you paid for. Right. You didn't come here to look at me and see how cute I am. Although I'm cute, you didn't come here and pay for that. Your mommy and daddy didn't pay for that. The federal government didn't pay for that. You're not going to be paying back these student loans because oh, I need to see Dr. T look cute. No, you came here because you wanted to learn X, Y and Z. Because of how much restrictions have been put on me as a black woman, as a black person in this country, as a woman, I have found myself at this point in my life, I have just saying, fuck it, I'm going to show up. The adjustments that we make are automatic, speaking in a softer tone to be seen not as loud or making sure that you don't fulfill stereotypes to be seen as smart, as different, as multifaceted with diverse interests and experiences. And I think that's particularly so for those of us who are in the quote unquote black professional spaces, who are the highly educated black folks, or as uh, W.E. Du Bois said, the talented 10th, the ones that are the lawyers, the doctors, the engineers, the ones that have gone to college, they got the masters, they have the masters, they have an MBA, they have a PhD, they have a law degree, they have a business degree, they have a fine arts degree, they have a, a medical degree, they have all these things, and we have to appear a certain way. And I still have to work 10 times as hard as my white colleague just to be taken seriously. And it's exhausting. We need to stop doing that. The fact that most black people have been socialized to make these adjustments to code switch. And the fact that when I say code switch, you know what I mean? How you show up in front of white people and how you don't, how you speak like this. Hi, I'm La- I'm LaToya. How are you doing? Instead of saying, what's up? I'm Toya. <laughs> like you don't do that in front of white folks. And it's like, That doesn't make any sense. And yes, we did that to survive in white America, but we need to stop. Okay. And on top of all these things, I grew up in a Caribbean immigrant household, which adds on an extra layer of wanting to belong because of immigrant status. So my mother made sure I spoke well and wrote well and tried really hard to make sure that I dressed in a way that I'd be taken seriously. Obviously, like I just said, it's still a long-standing battle between the two of us it just did not help there was just so many more extra expectations that were placed upon me which comes from my mother's own experience and being an immigrant and all these rules that are placed upon immigrants to be able to become citizens and to be successful in a new place outside of their native land so I can't blame that I know it's not experience that is unique to me because it's something that I've heard from other children of of immigrants or immigrants themselves where that their parents are always very much concerned about the presentation of themselves and of their children and of the presentation of success because if I came here I gotta have proof that migrating to this new country to America was worth it you must be successful you must come off as the best Uh, self that you can be so I can brag to everybody like oh look my child has this my daughter has done this my son has done this or I have done this there was always these expectations about not acting as badly as Americans and for those who are immigrant kids you know what I mean when your parents say Americans it depends on the context of like you don't want to be like those Americans sometimes Americans can be African Americans and it being an, an ethnic comparison of like, you need to be better than this group that we have been taught is the bottom of the barrel, even though there are plenty of examples of how they have lost their lives for you to be able to have these rights to be treated equally or semi equally. Or it could be Americans as in white people, white Americans, or it's Americans just in general, like Caribbean people eat like this and and American people eat like this, as in differences between cultures and not just the people. So there was a lot of just like, oh my gosh, my mom's going to say like, I'm acting like an American. Oh my gosh, I can't do that. You're acting like those Americans, you're Americans. And having to kind of contend with what does that mean? And when you say that, and I'm an American, but you're an American also by naturalization what does that mean (laughs) how do we make these distinctions to be able to understand how to present ourselves but 
I know parents in general are trying to do all these things because they don't want us to be denied opportunities because of our blackness or based off of our status as uh, racial or ethnic minorities or as gender minorities or whatever. They want the best for us. They'll make these suggestions. And I know that's where it comes from with my mother, that she wants the best for me and she wants me to be able to be successful. But the world around us is changing so fast. And we're in two different generations where her generation had different expectations than what my generation does. And then the generations below me have even more different expectations. And I'm just like, well, why can't we just all be ourselves as long as we're respectful to others in that way? Like not purposely trying to offend people. The whole idea is to assimilate into certain groups in order to be seen as equal. And that's why there are so much pressures, particularly on black people and people of color to conform to arbitrary white standards of professionalism and respectability. I'm gonna keep saying it because that's what it is. Uh, I think this is also tied to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you've ever seen that triangle where the five stage model is divided into two parts, usually deficiency needs and growth needs. The first four levels are deficiency needs, starting from the bottom, which is the largest part of the pyramid and the ones that are your greatest needs. And then going all the way to the top level, that is where you have your growth needs. The deficiency needs are said to motivate people when they are unmet for example the longer a person goes without food the more hungry they will become one must satisfy this hunger this deficient need before progressing on to meet higher level growth needs our activities become habitually directed towards meeting the next set of needs that we have yet to satisfy so you wake up in the morning and you need to eat breakfast you're hungry you do that and then you can focus on your next need so the bottom level is your physiological needs then you have your safety needs which is being secure and safe and then our psychological needs need to be met which is belongingness and love needs your intimate relationships and your friends and then you move on to your esteem needs which is feeling accomplished uh, achieving certain statuses and then the last is self-actualization which is the need for self-fulfillment actually achieving one's full potential, including creative activities, pursuing the things that you love and being able to be you. That is the top of the triangle of his hierarchy of needs, which means that you have to go through four different levels before you can actually get to meeting the needs of being your authentic self <laughs> and doing the things that make you happy. Making it, it the last need to be fulfilled means that sometimes you don't reach it or it's the first thing that you put aside to fulfill the other needs. And once you have accomplished all these needs, then you can actually be yourselves. And I think a good example of this among people of color is Beyonce after formation. Like Beyonce became black, 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 even though she's always been black. She's never addressed social issues until she had already reached all these milestones in her career after she had single ladies and it was the biggest song of the year and she won the grammy for it and she had all these grammys when she had become beyonce you know outside of destiny child she's beyonce queen b okay when she became all these things then all of a sudden she hit formation and white folks were just like what happened to the beyonce that, that was singing single ladies and doing the little cute dance who was this person showing up looking like a Black Panther wearing all black with with the bullet vest and got her fist in the air and talking about kneeling and talking about loving Afros and loving Jackson 5 nostrils? Like, who is this person? And since then, the last song that she put out was Black Parade. She talking about, I'm going back, back, back. I'm going back, 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 back to the South where my roots aren't watered down. She talking about being black. That's the reason why they always mad. Like, this is a completely different Beyonce than who sang Single Ladies and Crazy in Love, right? She's always been the same person, but it's obviously her getting to a point where she can be herself. But that took a lot of work for her to get there. Uh, Maslow noted that only one in a hundred people become fully self-actualized because our society rewards motivation primarily based on esteem, love, and social needs. We put all those other needs before being our self there's so many benefits to being your authentic self showing up to the world the way you want to show up the way you are and being accepted when we are authentic we stay true to ourselves we are who we generally are we are present in the here and now we do what makes us happy we follow our passions regardless of who we disappoint or how it may be perceived by others living a life of authenticity is a constant effort and means sacrifice not everybody in our lives will respond well to our authentic self when we are being authentic we are being vulnerable 
We are showing all parts of us, the good with the bad. When we do this, we allow for more intimate and honest relationships and we allow for true acceptance and unconditional love of ourselves. I am a weird black girl. I am an awkward, nerdy, uh, wretched, smart black girl. I'm blackity black, black, black. I'm Afrocentric. I'm feminist. I'm liberal. I am all of these things. So... What can we do? Here are simple tips to start being your authentic self today. Number one, love yourself. Love yourself. Loving who you are allows you to put out those aspects of yourself that sometimes you keep hidden. Number two, and that helps with number one, is stop comparing yourself to other people. Now, I I hate to make it seem like I'm piling up on my mama, but I was raised by my mother in a single parent household. And I constantly got the comparisons. That's how she felt like she was encouraging me, trying to push me in the right direction. But I usually found those comparisons not helpful. Oh, this person wouldn't do that. They wouldn't act like this. This person got into this program and this person started selling candles during the pandemic. What are you doing? And it's like, I'm being me. Who said I want to make candles? Don't pressure me into making candles and I don't like doing it and it's going to smell like shit because I don't want to do it. Stop comparing yourself to others. Be strong in who you are, love, and be comfortable in your own process, in your own journey to know that what is meant for you is meant for you and not meant for someone else. So if it's happening for them, it's happening for them because that's what's in their process, in their journey. And when it happens for you, it happens for you. The the best way to be your authentic self is not to be someone else. Number three, release patterns and beliefs that no longer serve you. Sometimes we do things and people like it and it catches on and people identify us with those things but eventually they just don't serve us anymore I think a good example is Dave Chappelle when he left the Chappelle show it just wasn't serving him anymore it was fun when he was making fun of Rick James and doing all of these characters but eventually he was like yo I felt like these white folks were laughing at me and not with me and it just didn't serve me anymore so I stopped people thought he was crazy for doing that but That was him being his authentic self and releasing a pattern that no longer served him. If it's no longer fun, why are we doing it? We have to be able to recognize what these patterns are and be okay with changing them when they no longer serve us. Number four, journal and track your behaviors and your thoughts. How does it feel when you are being yourself as opposed to when you are presenting who you're supposed to be? Do you notice anything physically or emotionally different? Do you feel happy or guilty when you're being authentic or or are you tired? Does your breathing patterns change at all? Do you notice an appetite change or headaches? Are your thought patterns different? Are your thoughts more positive, negative, or more focused on materialistic things? You have to practice identifying them. Number five, do not let other people police the way you show up. Yes, there are dress codes for certain spaces that you have to be in. Show up as yourself within expectations as long as it doesn't require you to compromise. Number six, view being yourself, being unapologetically you as a form of self-care because it is. For my black women, being unapologetically black in all spaces that we inhabit is a form of self-care. Be yourself. Be free. Be you. And see that as a form of self-care because it is taking care of yourself. Do not tiptoe through life. Let them hear every motherfucking step that you take. Make them see you. Be yourself. And take joy in it. Number seven. Recognize that this (laughs) takes time. Give yourself grace enough to get there. It's not going to happen overnight. It's a growing process. It takes time. So give yourself that grace. I want to end this section with another quote. uh, This time from former Teen Vogue editor-in-chief Elaine Welteroth. And she says, when you exist in spaces that weren't built for you, sometimes just being you is revolutionary. Let's move over to the last section, which is figuring this out. And this one, this one real short. I'm going to get right to it, right? So figure this out for me. Why do folks delight uh, over violence against black women? So where this is coming from, Megan Thee Stallion, if you don't know, she's a rapper, up and coming, very hot. She recently was shot in the foot, allegedly by someone that she was involved with, a producer, writer, artist, another person in the entertainment uh, industry. And even though we don't know all the details, somehow people still found a way to make memes of this black woman being shot and injured. Memes of her and, and Tory Lanez, who 
allegedly did this to her, showing him with a gun and her running off. She had to tell them, this is not funny. I went through a real trauma. Someone committed a crime against me. I was taken to the hospital to take out the bullets that were in my foot after being shot by this person. It's showing how some folks, including black men, do not care about black women, do not protect black women, do not respect black women, do not love black women. What is it? Where's the sport and protection for black women? women. Why are Breonna Taylor's murderers not arrested? We got George Floyd's murderers, but what about Breonna Taylor's murderers? Where are those people? Why is the DA, who is a black man, just dragging his feet to investigate and and charge these murderers? Why? Is it because she's a black woman and we don't take black women's lives seriously? Like, I just don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. If you can figure that out, you let me know. And with that, I am done. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you guys found it useful. If you like it, like I said before, please do me a favor and share this with three other people. Why? Because three is my favorite number. And that's the way that we grow as a group. And it's still my birthday mine, and I really appreciate it. It'll be a great present to me. Another great present is if you have not done so already, subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to it and rate and review the podcast again, wherever you're listening to it. It helps the podcast grow and, and it brings me joy. So I want to end this by saying wherever you are, whatever time it is, I want you to be blessed, to stay safe and I practice being your authentic self in all spaces at work at home with your friends with your kids with everybody be yourself be your authentic self and i will talk to you guys next week all right bye